On today's podcast from the archives, we're joined by the tight ends coach at Air Force, Jonathan Heimbach. When he joined us the last time, he was with the Toronto Argonauts. Since then, he made an appearance in the AAF with the San Antonio Commanders. Then he joined the XFL with the Tampa Bay Vipers. He has a wealth of experience. He's the son of a coach. He's made it up through the high school level all the way into the professional ranks. Now at Air Force as the tight ends coach, I was really impressed by him as a teacher and a coach and his ability to lead and build a position group, and I think you will be too. Enjoy the podcast. I am excited to be joined for the first time by a coach from the North, a coach from the CFL, the Toronto Argonauts, the offensive line coach there, Jonathan Heimbach, or as his players like to call him, Coach Jaime. Coach, it's great to have you here on the podcast. Thanks, Keith. Thanks for having me on. Coach, uh, your your experiences are uh, you know expanding basically every level um, from beginning at the high school level and and uh, then going to uh, JUCO, uh, being on an FCS staff, FBS staff, uh, working in the CFL at the professional level. So uh, you, you have uh, quite a resume and, and a lot of stops along the way. Um, let's talk about those a little bit before we get into some of the other things that you know, we prepped for uh, before we started this conversation. Um, tell me about that experience in, in becoming a coach, first of all, um, you know, your, your first stop at the high school level. <laughs> well, I grew up a, uh, a coach's kid, so I've, I've been around the game of football since, since I can remember. Uh, I was very fortunate to, uh, to grow up in a household of, of, of coaching, of football, of, of, of seasons. And so my dad was a, uh, was a high school coach and also a college uh, coach and, and then got into administration. So, um, I, I grew up, I was born in Connecticut, but then spent time in, in Ohio, um, North Carolina and California. So as most coaches, kids, you, you gotta be, a, you gotta be flexible and you gotta right. be able to, uh, adjust all the time. And, uh, so I saw that from an early age, both my brothers ran as far away from coaching as they possibly could. <laughs> and then I guess I didn't pay attention and, uh, just followed suit. And like you said, I've been at a lot of different levels. Um, I, I tried to play as long as I possibly could, uh, until nobody was, uh, was hiring me to play anymore. I, I had a brief professional career, um, uh, and then, uh, started coaching my in and out of NFL training camps. I was coaching back at my high school. Um, I was a English teacher. I had five periods of, of <laughs> American and British literature. I was the head strength coach at my high school at Damien High School in Southern California and, uh, and coaching the offensive line. So that was really my first experience hands on in coaching. And I absolutely loved the high school level working with kids that, that just were sponges and wanting to soak everything up. I uh, went on to be a graduate assistant uh, at UNLV for John Robinson, who I played for at USC. I uh, spent a number of years learning, uh, learning the game. Uh, under Coach Robinson, Rob Boris, who was the offensive line coach, who's now uh, with the Buffalo Bills, is, is who I was a GA for. Um, I, I just thought that I would automatically get a Power Five job. Just I, I was so clueless going into coaching after being a graduate assistant. But my actually first time, first full time um, paying job was at a junior college at Santa Barbara city college in, in California. And I was there opening the weight room. And I think I got paid more as an adjunct professor, um, opening the weight room and working in the weight room there than I actually did as my coaching stipend. I uh, did that for a year and, uh, and then bounced up to the Canadian football league, uh, for a season as a full-time offensive line coach. Then, um, then back to UNLV was hired full-time at, at, uh, under John Robinson at UNLV, uh, then was a high school coach. And I thought I was going to be a high school coach for the remainder of my time uh, back in Southern California. And then uh, a year later, had an opportunity to go coach at San Diego State University under Chuck Long. Um, after that, after spending three years there, I was back to the Canadian Football League in Montreal with Mark Tressman. We won two back-to-back Grey Cup championships up there. Uh, had a tremendous experience learning from Mark, uh, and then went to Wake Forest with Jim Grobe, uh, and was a great teacher. I learned so much from so many of these head coaches that I've worked under. Uh, but Coach Grobe really put things in perspective, how important family is, how important the relationship 
with uh, with your players uh, how vastly important that is that you can connect with players, not just being on the field. Um, after being at Wake Forest, then I went uh, back to the Canadian Football League for a few years, was with the Edmonton Eskimos, uh, Toronto Argonauts, and then uh, was with the Nevada Wolfpack with Brian Polian as the head coach there. Uh, and then most recently last year, uh, back to Toronto. So as you can see, I've been north and south of the border, lots <laughs> of different levels, um, had a lot of different influences upon me, um, but love coaching uh, and just the, the aspect of, of being around guys that want to learn, whether it's high school, college, or pro, that's, that really is, is what gets me up in the morning and excited to, to be a coach. Coach, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here and test your uh, your Brit lit knowledge. I, I was an English teacher as well. Did that for ten years. Uh, All right, we're re- okay. we're recording this on April 23rd. So uh, I'm gonna ask you, what famous uh, literature writer was born on April 23rd? Oh, you got me. Um, <laughs> um, Without being able to Google it immediately right in front of me right now, I, I think you stumped me. Um, I, go ahead. We we got William Shakespeare birthday today. Oh well, of, of course. I mean, I, I should have just taken my best guess um, <laughs> that uh, that it was Shakespeare's birthday today. Of course. How many plays of his did you have to teach? Oh, <laughs> I think I had two or three throughout uh, the year that I was. Um, teaching British lit. Uh, I, I think what was kind of cool is, is I was a creative writing English major when I went to USC and I, I would much rather, um, be in an English class talking to students and players than, than being in a, um, being in a math class. I mean, it's just, that's just wasn't how I was wired. I would right. much rather talk about, um, and, and be able to relate to, my high school players and they know that they could, they knew that they could always come in my room and it wasn't just a typical, um, coach player relationship. And when I had a couple players in my classroom that would say, geez, coach is a little bit more than just the O line coach or in the weight room to be able to relate to them that way, I think really, uh, was able to build more relationships with the players outside of just being on the field. Yeah, that was something, uh, I took pride in as well because you know, uh, you know this. You, you kind of get that stereotype as as being the football coach. Uh, I remember I, I started <laughs> at one high school and I was co- you know I always got the freshman for some reason. They always dumped the freshman on me, so I I taught Romeo and Juliet like sixty four times. I probably could recite most of it, uh, but I remember right. remember being asked by one of the kids like, "You're a coach. When are you going to put the movie on?" <laughs> you know that was the right. expectation. <laughs> Well, of course they put you with the freshmen because it's like you got the the freshmen are always nuts. They're always crazy. So they stick the, the coach with them. So not the stereotype, you know, why you probably had the freshmen. It's because they're all they're all fired up. So the, I think the coaches usually get either the freshmen to set the tone early in the high school years or they give you the seniors because they're going nuts. So right. it always seems to be that the, the coaches always got either the first year students or, or the senior itis group. But yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, if you show that you're passionate about whatever you're teaching, whether it be five man protection or like you said, Romeo and Juliet, if, if, if your audience knows that, that you're into it, that you're vested and, and that you aren't just going to flip the movie on or that you're just going to, you know, roll out the same drills that, that they're going to take some interest in what you're teaching. And, and, uh, for that 50 minute period, they're in or, you know, maybe that 15 minute, meeting that you're going to have with your players, knowing that you're really trying to stimulate them. And, and I know you talked about the, um, you know, kind of the stereotype. I remember walking into classes when I was at USC and I was an English major. I was the only 6'3", 300-pound uh, English student, well, creative writing major, walking into some of those classes. They were like, no, you, what are you doing in this classroom? You should be down the hall at uh, Rocks for Jocks. So it was a little bit different when I was a student also. Yeah, definitely. Uh you know, the, the thing you hit upon there and, and it's something you talked about as we were warming up for this interview is that, um, it, it's really, you know, whether it is the classroom or the field, uh, yet you really have to engage those students, 
Um, and that really starts with communication. You need to be a great communicator. You need to uh, make yourself self accessible to those kids, um, whether again, whether it's the classroom or the field, uh, because there's a lot of things that will grab their attention if, if you're not doing that. No, there's no doubt. I mean, kids can smell it from a mile away. If, if you're just kind of showing up to practice and, and not really engaged in what's going on and, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to buy into to what you're trying to get them to do. And, and I think the thing that I have learned in over 20 years in coaching and being around some excellent teachers is y- you have to do more than just build a relationship with guys on the field and on the sidelines. It, it's got to be in the locker room. It's got to be in the weight room. It's got to be on campus. It's got to be in the classroom. What, however you can get to know your players. Um, and that's one of the things that, uh, that I took away from guys like Jim Grobe that, you know, be around them in the locker room. You know, you may, you may get angry or, or, you know, you may raise your voice at a player on the field but you can't leave the facility. You can't leave campus that day if you are hard on a player and not go into the locker room and go in and tell them why, hey, I was disappointed in you because you had a missed assignment or whatever it may be. But you got to go in that locker room and you got to put your arm around them. And it may be one-on-one. It may be right in front of a couple other guys and be like, hey, I know, you know, you and I both know you're better than that. And so just finding ways to communicate with the players, getting to know their girlfriend's name, you know, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, what makes this kid tick? You know, what's he into outside of ball? What's he into on campus? You know, what are, that really shows the player that shows your student athletes that it's more than just, Hey, I got to teach, I got to teach my blocking scheme. I got to teach the, the, the quarterback reads. I got to, I gotta, they gotta memorize the drops. They gotta memorize the line twist, whatever it may be. Like you, those kids gotta know that you're looking out for them. And it's not just the, the product on the field. It's players want to know that you have a vested interest in them. They're gonna keep coming back for more. I know, coach, uh, I guess you could call it the art of teaching or coaching. Uh, a big part of that is figuring out how each of your students, each of your players, uh, learns and what they're going to respond to, both in, in forms of communication as well as as the uh, content that you're you're producing for them, the things that they're going to learn from all those tools. And I remember a story uh, in talking to uh, he's a former uh, um, uh, Colonel uh, Craig Flowers, uh, and who who was doing some work in athletics and in really uh, helping you know work, was working with a company that helped to identify um, student. Uh, uh, kind of learning um, patterns or, or the way they, um, you know, the modes in which they learned. And he brought up uh, Ricky Williams and how Ricky Williams um, was just known for always missing meetings. And, you know, they, they sat down with him, they asked, and he was looking back and why, you know, wh- why did that happen is because it didn't connect with him. It, did, it made no sense for him to be sitting in that meeting. He got nothing out of it. And because of that, and that his coaches, you know, struggled to identify that, he didn't become the best he could be, nor did everybody, you know, involved in the process obviously have, uh, you know, an experience that was, uh, you know, 100% satisfying. There was a lot of frustration there. So a, a coach's <laughs> job or the art of coaching really is to figure those things out. Yeah, no doubt, Keith. I mean, like I said about trying to reach your players, you know, they're not all going to learn the same way. And, you know, you bring up the example of, you know, Ricky Williams, he may not want to be in a meeting where certain guys may be able to just open a playbook and learn by reading whatever the quarterback reads may be, whatever the, the route depth is, you know, whatever the, the assignment is for an O-lineman in protection, so on and so forth, and they're good to go and they're ready to, to step on the field. Other guys need to see a video example of it. And other, uh, you know, maybe it's cut-ups from last season or cut-ups from, you know, when you did it last year or maybe themselves. Like a lot of times players have a hard time watching other people. They want to watch themselves. So Mm -hmm. to be able to show them, hey, this is what we're trying to do, or the good old 
put on the NFL or put on, you know, put on Alabama, put on USC, whoever it may be, they're going to really lock in to watch that maybe a little bit more than, than just watching a cut up of your own spring stuff or, or last year and just trying to find different ways to stimulate your players to, to know their roles, to know their rules, to get the assignments done. You know, and then those, there are other guys that they can't learn in a classroom setting. You need to sit with them one-on-one in your office. You need to draw it up on the board. And then I think more so guys need to learn with hands-on with, they need to go do a walkthrough. Mm-hmm. Okay. Here's how we're going to install our seven man spacing, you know, gap fits on the defensive front. And you need to put up those trash cans and the middle linebacker needs to see, uh, you know, strong backflow or split backs or down blocks and where to fill and, and not just put it on a piece of paper and expect the kid to get it. And, and I've learned this not only just through trial and error because we all uh, are creatures of habit, but I learned in my own family that, you know, I, I have two sons and they learn very differently. Uh, one of them is basically a photographic memory and you tell him once and he's got it or if he sees it. And, and the other one, uh, deals with a learning disability and has dyslexia and is a high achiever, but just needs to, he can't just sit there and read something. He needs to do books on tape. Right. And, you know, in your own way, you got to give your players different ways to, to install your offense and defensive schemes and what your expectations are. And so, you know, the example of Ricky Williams, well, he, he didn't want to go to a meeting because there may be some, some fear or, or, you know, they don't want to be in that type of public setting that they would rather meet one-on-one or they would rather do it on the field. And so I think coaches are getting better. And I know I've improved the way that I uh, install schemes and, and talk to players and make corrections and, and because and, everybody's going to learn differently. So we've got to coach, we've got to teach differently that, that players need to have that multi curricular uh, information that they're going to be able to take the the scheme and, and pick it up in their own way of learning and that we can't just be so archaic in the way that we install stuff. So amen to that, brother. I am, uh, I am all in with trying to um, trying to get guys to play fast, but uh, the faster they can learn it, the faster they can go do it on the field. Yeah, absolutely. Coach um, for you, is there a process you go through and, and, trying to evaluate and determine, you know, where those players are at or, or how you're tailoring the curriculum, or are you just up front producing something that's, that's going to some way or another, each guy's going to be able to, uh, I guess, uh, grasp onto and say, this is the direction I'm going with my learning. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's all a matter of your resources that are available to you. I know that some places I've been at that we were able to do actually personality testing to find out, you know, how guys will learn what, what makes them tick. And they, they have a, a, a basically a standardized test, which will tell you um, their personality traits and, and others. If you don't have those resources available to you, you know, you, you've got to be able to reach out maybe to some of the other coaches. Hey, I've got a kid that's coming out. I'm in, I'm a high school offensive line coach and I've got this ex basketball player or ex baseball player why don't you cross pollinate and go talk to that coach and say hey how does how does bobby figure it out you know what were some of the way hey is he a kid that i can that can take some harsh criticism or you know what if you if you put this kid on the spot uh, he's going to go into a shell and he can't learn in a group setting, you need to sit down and talk to this kid Mm one-on-one or talk to the teachers, you know, just thinking about it in a high school setting. Hey, look, this kid is a leader. He's outspoken. You can use him as the example. Then by all means, go ahead and, you know, if he does something good or does something that is incorrect, you can, you can make an example of him and he's going to respond in a positive way, as opposed to a kid that's going to go to in a shell and, not trust you and those type of things. So I think just number one resources, try to talk to other people about how maybe your kids are learning. And then, you know, maybe you need to have a playbook online. Maybe you need to have a paper copy. Maybe you need to have your cutups on huddle 
that a kid can go to it that way and learn your scheme on his own time and give him a little self-corrected test that, hey, this is install one for spring practice. Here's our schemes. I want you to study these three schemes and then be able to get up on the board and show me what the three schemes are. I mean, get, find different ways and, and see what works with each kid. And it may be, okay, he watched the cutups or he looked at the film. Uh, he looked at your playbook and then he needs to go out and do a walkthrough. And then he can tell you when he's, when he's out there in a non competitive environment, just to be able to teach you on the field. Cause if your kids can tell you what you are trying to, to, to coach, then you know that they've got it. If they use your language, right. If they say the things that you say, if, if they use your buzzwords and your coaching words, then you know, it's really sunk in. If they keep saying it in their terms, maybe you need to change the way that you speak so that they understand what you're trying to say, maybe within their vocabulary also. Yeah, I I think that's a great point, Coach, because I think part of the process is is, uh, learning what resonates with them uh, and letting them take some, you know, uh, control and be empowered to uh, to help themselves learn this. And that's that was always something like, you know, with with my O line, we would start with some kind of standard calls and different things, and yeah. you know, then those guys, I mean, you would listen. Sometimes I would have no clue based on their calls what was going to happen because they had kind of morphed those into something that made sense to them and in their communication and those five guys yeah. working together. And I thought, Hey, it's great. I mean, if I have to get involved in now and go back and, and micromanage that process, then I'm hurting their learning that they've, they've figured out something a little bit better uh, to make it their own. I think with those things happen uh, and, and they are able to communicate with each other, teach each other, et cetera, uh, you got a positive thing going. Yeah, that's no doubt. I mean, I laugh just, you know, I, I coach guys now that are professionals in the Canadian football league and, you know, they're, they're not millionaires by any means. They're making a good living. Uh, they, they're getting paid to play the game that they love. Um, and it's so funny. Like I'll be, I'll be in meetings and all of a sudden there'll, there'll be some new buzzword from our walkthrough that, gives them kind of an indicator for edge pressure or how they're going to set differently. And, and I said, where did, where the hell did this come from? And you can't be so archaic to say, well, no, this is the only way to do things. Look, our eligibility's up. Right. I mean, it's done. We, we All we're trying to do is help them be the best players they can be out on the field. And if they've got some new little code word or buzzword that is going to help them be better pre-snap, that it's going to, get their eyes on the right thing or have an alert, then by all means, you need to take the wide out. You need to erase your playbook and you need to add some of that into your ways of communication. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, stuff, stuff comes up mid season. There's no doubt. I mean, we all have seen it that, Hey, we've got a new issue, a new blitz, a new protection scheme that we've got to have answers for. Then your coaching needs to evolve also. And they're the ones that have the best vantage point. And if they can play fast, and they can communicate, and one guy has a little buzzword or a term that he's going to say to the other, then by all means, then you empower your players. I mean, don't get me wrong. you, you got to have a set standard way to communicate yeah. expectations for uh, technique, and you have to stay with, you know, you have to color within the lines. Mm-hmm. But there's no reason that you can't give your players – that they can't mix the colors, but they got to stay within the lines. That if they want to, that if they want to put their flair on it, they've got to be able to do it as long as everybody has agreed to it before you go out onto the field game day. You know, try it my way early in the week on Monday, Tuesday. Hey, if they've got a new way to do it and they're going to get the job done, then by all means, as coaches, I believe that you have to be able to adjust to to your players and let them go out and play free. And, and that then when they come to the sideline, that they're not meeting the enemy. Uh, that was exactly. one of the things that my, my college coach, uh, Mike Barry, uh, was my line coach at, at SC and he had an excellent career and, and was one of the most decorated offensive line coaches at Colorado and Tennessee. And when he coached me at SC, I mean, he was hard on us. There, there was times I really wondered if I wanted to play college football, um, 
But he always said, once you come to the sideline during a game, you will never meet the enemy. That you, that they have to know during the heat of the game that when it's going down and you're in a hostile environment and the players are the ones out there having to do it between the hash marks, that they know that when they come to the sidelines, sure, there's different ways to get your point across, but the last thing they want is a coach screaming at them on the sideline when they've got 11 guys across from them that are trying to beat them, that they better know that they've got their coaches and their teammates that are, uh, that are, you know, in their, in their corner that are going to fight for them. So I think that's something that I've learned from my coaches and I try to uh, emulate is, is that players need to know that you've got their back. And, and when they're out there competing, that uh, they're the ones that have to solve the problems, but we got to do this thing together. Coach, I, I love that idea. I think it's a great point. And too many times uh, you see that happen, that guys, coaches, get caught up in, in the, the emotions of battle, get caught up in, in wanting to be successful. And you're right, they're the enemy when it comes to the sideline. And now those guys are, you know, they're, they're fighting on the field and they're fighting when they're off the field as well. And, and obviously players are going to be p- playing better when they're confident when they believe and uh, you meet them on the sideline, you're the enemy. It's not exactly going to happen. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're sure. I, I can't say that I'm hugging every single player right. that comes <laughs> off the sideline, but they, they have to know that you want the best for them, that you want them to be successful. And, you know, there may be a guy that you have to grab by the face mask and look him right in the eye and say, I know that you're better than this, or it may be, a guy that you've got to do jumping jacks on the sideline to get him to play harder. That you guys say, Hey man, pick it up. You're not covering. You're not, you're not running to the ball. You're not pursuing whatever it may be. But our job is to help the players be as, as good as they can, whether it's the high school environment, whether it's college, whether it's professional, look, players are going to buy in if they know that you just want to help prolong their career and help them be successful on the field. And as a, as an ex player and as a current coach, you you can't, you can't ask for anything more that this coach wants the best for me. And I, I, I'm in an environment also in the off season. I work with Nike with the Nike opening camps all across the country and work with some of these just freak five-star O linemen that, that, look like they should be drafted you know it's it's Mm -hmm. insane working with some of these kids but they know that when when we coach them at the nike opening camps that really there's no recruiting there's no we just want to see those kids be successful and and they're going to soak it up and take every little bit of coaching but i tell them hey look your high school coach is the boss like we may teach you a technique that we're trying to do to help you win this drill this competitive one-on-one drill but you've got high school coaches that really do it for free. You know, they, they've got a, a coaching stipend that hardly pays for the gas to get them to practice. So, you know, as long as players know that the coaches are, are vested in them and putting their uh, hard work and, and limiting time with their family, then players know, hey, I'm in. This coach has my back, that he wants to see me be successful you're going to build such a great relationship and have a great experience with those players and coaches that there's nothing like it out there. Absolutely, Coach. And uh, taking a step back to what we were talking a few minutes ago about that idea of making sure uh, they color within the lines, uh, I used used to uh, to call that educated freedom. I, I picked that up from uh, uh, a coach in Kentucky, Andrew Coverdale, high, really good high school coach. Uh, and that was just part of the philosophy of, of their offense is that he wanted guys to have educated freedom. That means that at some point they know exactly what they're supposed to do, how to do it. Um, but as they start to learn more about that, you know, he understands that those lines that we draw very straight and, and precisely on paper and on diagrams um, are pretty dynamic on the field and that if players have the ability – uh, to work within their athletic abilities or skills along with their knowledge um, and that educated freedom that that's going to make them better and really take them to the next step. You don't want robots on every single play yet at the same time, like you said, they got to stay within the lines. Yeah. You, you, you need to have a certain amount of trust within the 
scheme that you're trying to accomplish, whether it be offense, defense, or special teams. Uh, but a lot of times those, those X's and O's that you drew up on the board or you walk through are different come Friday night or Saturday afternoon or, or Sunday morning, you know, whenever you're playing all of a sudden, Ooh, it's not exactly what we prepared for coach. <laughs> and we've got to make some adjustments. Hey there, we thought they were going to be a four down front. All of a sudden they're coming out in this three down or, you know, solid front, bare front. And we got to have our rules in place that just thinking from an O-line standpoint, You have to have your rules in play, but if you have veteran players that are able to get you out of a bind, hey, look, we we always tell our center, you got the keys to the car, man. I mean, right now you're you're the one driving. So as long as all five guys up front are on the same page, there's a lot of different ways to cut it. There's a lot of different ways to to block a certain scheme. And we'll make those corrections, whether it be on the sideline, whether it be in between series or halftime. But as long as all five are on the same page and, and everybody on the field is is all uh, open to the communication, then as a coach, you got to let them make make the decisions they, that they've got to steer the car in the right direction. So giving them the educated freedom uh, to go ahead and make those calls, make those adjustments, do so. And... Um, what you don't want is is a bunch of guys going in a lot of different directions, and <laughs> you could you could have a running back make the the greatest run in the world, or a quarterback make the greatest throw, receiver, so on and so forth. But you got to have all five fat boys working together. There's no no doubt about that. They can't be independent contractors. So no. it, it's got to be the boys up front. They they got to all be on the same page, and have to be excellent communicators. Absolutely. And coach, I've found that some of the best teams that I've coached or been a part of, uh, that group was almost, uh, they, they certainly weren't separate because they were bought into the culture of the program. Uh, but they were a culture within a culture, um, a little bit different in some <laughs> ways. Uh, as, as the leader of that, as a coach, how do you develop that, that, that bond of, of getting those five guys to, uh, blend together and to work well? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think the number one thing when, when you, when you take that eligible jersey off and everybody goes through it at some point, they thought they were going to be a D lineman. They thought they were going to be a tight end. They thought they were going to be a fullback. And once you put that 50 to 79 on, you just got to put your ego aside and you are now a part of something bigger than yourself that you have to empower those guys, that group, that as a whole, they're just different than everybody else. Sure, you've got receiver groups, and you've got the quarterback room, and you've got the D-line, and you've got the corners, and but ultimately those guys are all independent contractors. You have to work five as one, and that the old adage of of, you know, if you strike something, if you punch someone, if you don't grasp all five fingers together and squeeze that fist tight, it's not going to be as strong as the individual finger that can break as an individual. Just the whole five links to the chain, what, whatever you want to make it, you know, I mean, I've had little different themes each season as you get to know your group of O-Lime and hey, we're, we've got to function five as one and that five as one is kind of a, a logo and a motto that I've used and it, you know, whether you give the guys the T-shirts or whether they're, you know, they get hats or they're the first ones that get to get on the bus. They're the, they get to go to training table first. They get the spaghetti meal first on the day before the, before the game. You know, they get something a little bit different that, you know, you need those guys to function at a high level for the skill players to get the production that they're looking for. And as a head coach, as a position coach, if you can make those guys feel special for being included, included in that group, then there'll be total buy-in. And whether it's the, you know, the theme, you know, my, my guys in Toronto this year, we're, we're going to be the goon squad. You know, I mean, we're just kind of the, the down and dirty blue collar goon squad. And that's just, that's just who we are. And we've all been there at the high school level, but even at the college and professional level, they just, we all want to be included. 
Yeah. It's a society where everybody wants to be a part of something more than just themselves. And that is the offensive line. It's not about myself. It's not me. It's I'm, I'm part of a, a, a greater whole. It's what can I do to help our unit function at a high level. And as soon as you've got guys that want to make it about me and, hey, look at me type of deal, and they're worried about the name on the back of the jersey, all those cliches, Look, you, you've got to get that, that ship righted. You, you got to get that guy to be a part of the unit, to be a part of the group. And however you want to build that culture, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But as soon as they buy into whatever you're selling and, and what type of, um, uh, namesake that they may have. When I was the offensive line coach at Nevada, there was a tradition built in Reno and Nevada that they were the union. They were the hard work and hard hat, punch the clock, show up every single day type of unit that was different than everybody else. And, and, you know, everybody's got, you know, the band of brothers, the, you know, however you want to build it. But Mm -hmm. if you can establish a culture um, in that unit rather than the individual, then it's really a fun group to be around. Definitely. And, uh, I know I've had different names for those groups I've coached or have played for me when I was the offense coordinator. And I know one group wanted to be the herd. I had another group wanted to be the pack. Another group was the pit bulls. Um, and it's funny how they take on the character too of that, uh, of that nickname. It, it, it just really embodies sure. what they're doing on and off the field. Yeah, no doubt. No, it's, it's fun, you know, and then, you know, they build that identity and that's who, you know, it's whatever is important, the standards that you set. Hey, we are the, we're the union or we're the pack or what, whatever it is that you're inclusive within that group. And there's a set standard and guidelines to say, Hey, this is how we operate. Hey, we may have goals. It's not going to be catches or yards or, you know, it's, Hey, our unit, we kept our quarterback clean by the end of the game the quarterback's uniform doesn't have to be washed. You know, that's our, that's our goals for the game. Hey, our running back rushes for 150 or, you know, those things, but it's not an individual thing in our group. And sure, you may have the individual, Hey, I had, I had five pancakes. Hey, I, I had three cut blocks and I had, you know, perfect pass pro stones, whatever it may be. You, you've got your standard within your room, but nobody outside of it cares. It's, it's just, your way of holding each other accountable. And that's what makes the O-line different than any other position in sport. And I tell the boys this all the time is that we are the only position in a sport that uses a ball that does not care where the ball goes. We do not look at the football. We have our back to the football, whether it's a run or pass. We are concerned with what the defense is doing. We are the only position in a game that uses a ball that is not concerned with the object of the ball. Our job is to cancel out and protect our offensive players. So I think once you build that kind of separation and specialization in that position, there's some buy-in from the group. Definitely. Coach, I have to ask you this question um, before we get to wrapping up. Um, Having coached, uh, you know, in the United States, an 11 man game and then and going and playing uh, Canadian rules. I mean, maybe it doesn't affect the offensive line as much. Um, but in, in your coaching, are there different things you need to uh, account for? Is it, uh, is it much different uh, in playing in one league versus the other? You know, there, there's only one difference, in that, and I've been back and forth. I mean, it's been literally hopscotch between the, the border, between yeah. the U.S. game that, that probably most people know probably most listeners that you have and the Canadian game really the only difference yeah there's motion yeah we only have three downs compared to four there's some kicking game adjustments the one that is really o-line and d-line specific is that there is a one yard neutral zone in the Canadian football league that the defensive line or I mean even corners that the defense has to be one yard from the line of scrimmage and so I found out that it's a little bit different within your footwork a little bit different within your aiming points and landmarks, I found out as a player. Because when I went up in 1999 and I was signed by the Toronto Argonauts, 
on a Tuesday and I started on a Saturday playing center and I'd only been a, a U.S. player, that the first snap in practice, I fell on my face as a center because you can't have so much forward lean that you've got to be, you've got to get one more step in the ground and you've got to be a little bit more patient in contact than you might have as a down south player south of the border. So when Americans come up and play for the first time in the CFL, I just tell them, hey, look, down south, I tried to coach you getting two steps in the ground before contact. The only difference is up here, get three steps in the ground before you're running your your run schemes. And you need to have a little bit more patience in your pass pro before you punch. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it's the same game you know. And, yeah, there's one extra DB and there's one extra wide receiver. But for the most part, the essence of the game is all the same, and it's just timing which has adjusted, as you and I know, that the, the game has evolved, whether it's wing T or spread or air raid or triple option. Look, the timing of contact is, is going to be a little bit different, um, but ball is ball. It doesn't matter whether there's 12 guys, everybody's running around in full motion, or 11 and everybody's stationary, and, and, and it, it's all the same. So trying to help a new American or a new viewer that's watching our game for the first time, it, it's all the same. Uh, and, and it's just getting those guys to go out and play fast. Coach, I know um, in talking to you for this this uh, 40 minutes or so, the thing that's really come through to, is the importance to you of, of learning, uh, both your own and your players. And uh, you know, what advice do you have to uh, the coach out there who's trying to you know, establish himself in this game uh, to find a direction for his career, et cetera. Uh, what advice do you have to that listener? Yeah, I think it's really important for coaches at any level, whether it be a youth coach, a high school coach, a head coach, you know, at any level, a college pro, whatever. It doesn't matter. Don't feel like there's any stupid questions. You know, ask when you go to the coaching clinic, ask that college or pro coach or whomever, junior college coach, division three coach, ask them for their email, ask them for their phone number. Say, if I have some questions, can I ask you? Because at some point that pro coach or that college coach was in your shoes. And I think that coaches just need to be open to put their egos aside and be students of the game, and whether it be practice organization, whether it be individual skills, whether it be scheme, look, don't be afraid to ask a question. Most often, coaches are going to be receptive to that. You know, I mean, it's we've all been there. We're all learning. I mean, as we talked before, it's football is a copycat league. It's a copycat game. It doesn't matter, excuse me, what league you're in, whether it be youth pop Warner, whether it be flag football, whether it be professional or major power five college, it's a big cycle and everybody's trying to find a new way to find new schemes and new ways to reach our players and get them playing fast. Same in coaching. Keep, keep all your options open. Don't be closed minded and don't be afraid to ask questions. Like I went and spoke at a clinic in a couple weeks ago in Quebec city, in in Quebec and you know I've got coaches that are asking asking me in French how they can become better coaches I mean be open to it I have guys email me all the time guys will hit me up on social media uh, on Twitter on Facebook you know Facebook and Instagram hey coach can you send me a drill to work on my double teams and you know look I wasn't the first one to do it and I won't be the last so however I can help grow the game of football I'm all in. And so that's why doing this stuff's kind of cool to, for you and I to talk about it and say, Hey, what are different ways that, you know, you've, you've had experiences with dealing with your players or whether it be scheme or whatever. And I think that's just the one thing that, Hey, be open to new ideas and don't in any way be intimidated not to reach out and ask people and have a mentor and, and try to try to take something away from everybody you come across. Absolutely, Coach. I agree with that. And social media makes it easier than ever today to get that done. Um, <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. 
Coach, to wrap up, uh, kind of the, the final question I always ask of, of coaches who uh, appear on the podcast is, you know, of all the things you do, if I were to ask you to point to one thing that gives your players the winning edge, one thing you guys do, what would that be? I, I think just, you know, giving your players the confidence to, to have that winning edge is that there's got to be a, a total 100% buy-in that, that you're in their corner and, and that the players know that, Hey, I'm, I'm here for you. And it may be, it may be talking about blocking schemes out on the bench in between series, or it may be some kid dealing with divorce at home or a girlfriend or you know, what, whatever academic issues. Look, let your players know that you're a resource that's available for them and, and just continue to build that bond. That's not just going to be when they cross the line and, and step on the field. It's, it's got to be one that the players know that you're always in it to help them reach whatever goals it may be. Sure. Every kid wants to play professionally. Every kid wants a scholarship, but the reality is football is going to be done someday and they're not going to be able to play anymore. Building those relationships and having that connection with a coach and a player that's going to go far beyond the time that they spent on the field or in the classroom or in the weight room I think those are all the reasons that we ultimately get involved in this game is because there's no game like it. And the things that you go through, the stresses that are put on you to know that the coach player relationship will go on far beyond the field, I think is really something that you always want to continue to foster and build within the players on your team. So um, just continue to, be around your players, build that rapport and relationship. And, and uh, that, that's what makes this sport and this position that we're in in coaching special. Coach, I know you're uh, on social media. How can our listeners connect with you? Uh, it's, uh, let me see, coach underscore Jaime. So coach underscore H-I-M-E-Y. Uh, that's on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, so if guys have any questions, whatever it may be, um, would love to communicate. I, I do some of the Nike opening stuff. So I, I, I come across a lot of high school coaches that are volunteering at those events, um, doing a lot of glazer clinics in the off season also, and then doing stuff like this. I mean, by all means, we all need to grow the game and find a different way to, to grow the science of the sport. Um, so you can reach me that way and, and, uh, also, email is coach. dot heimbach, h i m e b a u c h at gmail. dot com. So that's a way to get a hold of me. And uh, Keith, I'm excited that I could come on today, and hopefully, um, you know, we'll continue to grow this relationship. And and um, great to be a part of the podcast today. Yeah, absolutely, coach. It was great to have you. Uh, good luck to you and the Goon sw- Squad. Uh, this season <laughs> up north. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks, Keith. Thanks again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please stay tuned for more news on what we'll be doing here as we relaunch the podcast with new episodes in November. Follow me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please head over to iTunes and give five star for a rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast and we appreciate it.